are these people? So I brought with us uh, this this story from the old Chrissy Hedges. Um, I hope people call him Chrissy when they get to know him. You know, what's up, Chrissy? Um, anyway, <laughs> um, he put this story in consortium, like the Sopranos. Right? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey old Chrissy, huh? Hey, old Chrissy. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so he put this in sheer post, Chrissy did. Um, you want to talk about does, with the US does, midterms? Does he, Go ahead. Does he change does he change his mind? Say capitalism is really working and America yes. is on a soaring That's trajectory exactly, into the yep. 21st century. You got it. Um yeah, he was he's, fi he, he's finally turned around. Yeah, they're talking Drug about Biden to rot in jail. and other establishment yeah. politicians <laughs> that hope to paper over the rotten pain of the system they created with the same decorum they used to sell the country the con of neoliberalism. Sound about like Chrissy, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this guy, he's a great writer. I, I love Chris Hedges, but he really does kind of write the same article over and over again. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> like every yeah. article is basically <laughs> the same. Uh, it, it's it, everything he, sucks. He's, he's got, he's got, he's yeah, right, gotta, exactly. Right. He's, he's going to drop at least uh, one reference to Sheldon Lowen. Uh, right. yeah. He's, he's going to, Hannah Arendt will probably come up at some point. He like the will Chris Hedges in drinking something game? Something about, about a Roman. He will always bring up some Roman, either what they yeah. said or the excesses of the Romans. Kind of got he's kind of got a formula. He, yeah. He's this is one of those things when he dies and may he may he live forever. But when he dies, you could take these articles, put them into a chat bot, and just keep writing Chris Hedges articles forever. Yep. So Chris Hedges starts the bipartisan project of dismantling U.S. democracy, which took place over the last few decades on behalf of corporations and the rich, have left only the outward shell of democracy, the courts. Legislative bodies, the executive branch, and the media, including public broadcasting, are captive to corporate power. There is no institution left that can be considered authentically democratic. The corporate coup d'etat is over. They won. Americans lost. Um, the wreckage of this neoliberal project is appalling. Endless and futile wars to enrich a military-industrial complex that bleeds the U.S. treason of half of all dis uh, discretionary spending uh, deindustrialization that has turned U.S. cities into decayed ruins, the slashing and privatization of social programs, including education, utility services, and health care, which saw over one million Americans account for one-fifth of global deaths from COVID. Although the U.S. has 4% of the world's population, draconian forms of social control embodied in militarized police functioning as lethal armies of occupation in poor urban areas, the largest prison system in the world, a virtual tax boycott by the richest individuals and corporations, money-saturated elections that perpetuate our system of legalized bribery, and the most intrusive state surveillance of the citizenry in U.S. history. So yeah, life sucks, says Chrissy. Um, <laughs> but he wants to quote Gore Vidal. I don't know if you remember that guy. Um, United States oh, yeah. is funded by the oh, brightest yeah. people in the country, and we haven't seen them since. Um, United States of uh, Amnesia that uh, movie I just had the poster of, um, to quote Gore Vidal, the corporate press and the ruling class create fictional feel-good personas for candidates. Treat all political campaigns if it is a day at the races and gloss over the fact that on every major issue, from trade deals to war, there is very little difference between Democrats and Republicans. The Democratic Party and Joe Biden are not the lesser evil, but rather, as Glenn For Ford pointed out, the more effective evil. So he wants to start with Biden's record. Biden supported the campaign to discredit and humiliate Anita Hill to appoint Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. He was one of the principal architects of the endless wars in the Middle East, calling for, quote, taking Saddam down five years before the invasion of Iraq. He rehabilitated the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, after vowing to vote the country a pariah because of the assassination of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. Biden is a fervent supporter of Israel, calling the apartheid state the single greatest strength America has in the Middle East, Jack, and declaring, I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. His campaigns have been lavishly funded by the Israel lobby for at least two decades. 
you're keeping track at home. Um, in the 1970s, he fought school busing, arguing that segregation was beneficial for blacks. He and South Carolina's racist senator, Strom Thurmond, sponsored the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, which eliminated parole for federal prisoners and limited the amount of time sentences could be reduced for good behavior. Biden sponsored and aggressively pushed the 1994 crime bill, which he also helped draft, calling for its passage because we have predators on our streets that society has in fact, in part because of its neglect created, the bill expanded the death penalty for dozens of existing and new federal crimes and mandated life imprisonment for a third violent felony, also known as the three strikes and you're out rule, more than doubling the nation's prison population. Um, the bill provided funds to add 100,000 new police officers and build new prisons on the condition that prisoners serve their entire sentences. He pushed through the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which gutted the federal writ of hab habeas corpus, abolished the rights of death row prisoners, and mandated harsh federal sentencing rules. Um, there he is doing that at the 1994 crime bill, um, in case you were wondering who he was with. All those badges behind him. Um, you know. Yep. Um, Biden takes credit for writing the 2001 Patriot Act, which expanded the government's ability to monitor anyone's phone and email communications, collect bank and credit report reporting records, and track activity on the internet. Um, he backed austerity programs, including the destruction of welfare and cuts to Social Security. He fought for NAFTA and other free trade deals, which fueled inequality, deindustrialization, and a significant drop in wages and the offshoring of millions of manufacturing jobs to underpaid workers who toil in sweatshops in countries like Mexico, Malaysia, China, or Vietnam. There he is with old W. Um, but yeah, that's where but W signed in the Patriot Act. I don't know if you all remember that. That was a fun time. I remember John Stewart laying into him for that one. Um, he also backed the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act that, as Human Rights Watch writes, eliminated key defense against deportation and subjected many more immigrants, including legal permanent residents, to detention and deportation. Biden long opposed abortion, writing in a letter to a constituent, those of us who are opposed to abortion should not be compelled to pay for them. As you may know, I have consistently, on no fewer than 50 occasions, voted against Federal funding of abortions. Um, yeah, thought so far on just how shit Biden is, because he is. I mean, this is just like a brief overview of, I think, of shit we know. Um, yes. But I think, I just would kind of wish that, um, and it's not going to be, but I feel like something like this should be a little bit more on public record in terms of people to really kind of, reflect and kind of see you know like or read you know like some of the atrocities that Biden has basically committed you yeah. know on us you know I think just as far as like and I said this to you earlier Reef, like I was speaking to a friend you know in a couple of days ago because he was in Pennsylvania he was like voting for Fetterman you know and I you know and I didn't want to get into an argument with him because he's a friend but basically just being like you know like he's this 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 right you know, and like, he was like, oh, I'm voting for him because as a, a guy, like, I want to have abortion rights protected. And I was like, you do know that that could have been codified under Obama, right? He's like, no, it like, they didn't have the votes then. And I'm like, ay, 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 ay. like, like, we don't like, I can't fault him in a lot of ways, given where he was, but at the same time, just the ignorance of people in terms of like, either they forget or the little that they know in terms of like how the decisions that Biden has made has kind of influenced, you know, like what has come down the pipe now. And people don't know that or just really ignorant to it that something like this should be more readily available. This is what the like mainstream media should be talking about. And they don't, sure. you know, for reasons, you know, but, you but, know. but that that's where you really you can't you can't blame the people, right? No, it's, I, it's, no and like, because, because it, the system is not working the way it's supposed to. No. We're supposed to have this fourth estate 
where the media informs them and they don't inform them. No. People that... people got jobs, they got kids. You know, Keaton, he just puts his kids out in the backyard and tells them to go play mm-hmm. and he obsesses on politics all day. But you know, most people no, I drive for a living, so that... I get I learn about this shit while I'm working. That's really how I do it. Right. Listen, I'm driving my car all day, so I listen the, to on the podcasts radio, and all podcasts. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, but I say all that because I say, you know, on stream, you know, because I teach, you know, like I can't, like I can't physically or mentally want Twitter's just accessible. So, like, I, for my mental health, like it's not, you know, conducive, you know, especially with me working. But it's like I just call myself like a teacher just happens to care about politics and knowing how it influences my life that. I feel like on a minimal level, I should at least be in tune to what's happening because all these decisions these fuckers are doing, you know, like down the street from me, you know, affect me, you know, eventually. And I just wish people kind of take took that more to heart, you know, and something like this that Chris had would kind of help people. But, you know, but I think it's the idea of like, this is not being talked about in mainstream media. And if it is, it's usually against, you know, on the other team, you know, to kind of be like, you know, kind of get into more like a sports mentality in terms of like, this is my person. I'm going to be there and I'm going to be against you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's just, it's just nonsense. It's the, it's the, uh, you know, Taibi, Taibi and Thomas Franks have probably done the best writing. Yeah. On this. But Ta- Taibi has really made this his his mission to talk about how the media has just become siloed where you have one part of the pie. It's all a la carte information. Yeah. It's it's a uh, it's it is to news reporting what grape drink is to grape juice. Right. It's a it's a it's a grape juice like fake artificial <laughs> It is simulation, but it's it's that's very bad for you. <laughs> but, you know, it's not the thing itself. They they've gone all in on the commercial imperatives of riling people up and turning them into rage addicts. And this is it can't be manufacturing overstated. Consent well, the they're same also time. manufacturing. Yes, yes, they're manufacturing consent, and they're also manufacturing outrage they're manufacturing this hatred between Mm -hmm. people within the country which is extremely dangerous and other countries the biggest yeah the biggest single factor in why the conversation has gotten so toxic is the media the media turning towards commercial imperatives because people are much more likely to come back and watch tomorrow if you give them this world where there are good guys and there are bad guys and we're going to get those bad guys in the final reel, but you got to turn in tomorrow to see yeah. what the latest revelation and plot developments are. This really appeals to how people's minds work. Look at what all of the top performing movies of all time have been. They're all very simple, good versus evil stories that really right. uh, people really like that kind of a narrative. That's what they've turned our political discourse into mm-hmm. so it's well, no it's no surprise that people now at historic levels say they would not be friends with somebody of a different political party that they wouldn't date someone of a different political party that they've been conditioned to think this way well yeah. or or russia you know here's here's biden barely standing with ukraine um you know yeah. <laughs> like old chrissy hedges wants to point out that you know, Biden and the Democrats annually increase the military budget, approving eight hundred and thirteen yeah, yeah. billion per fiscal year in twenty twenty three. He and the Democrats have provided over sixty billion in military aid and assistance to the war in Ukraine, with no end in sight. They also have no exit strategies. Um, bad pullout game from the Dems. The decisions of politicians like Biden have a staggering human cost, not only for the poor workers. And the shrinking middle class, but for millions of people in the Middle East, millions of families ripped apart by mass incarceration, millions more forced into bankruptcy for our mercenary for-profit medical system where corporations are legally permitted to hold six children hostage 
While their frantic parents bankrupt themselves to save them, millions who became addicted to opioids and hundreds of thousands who died from them, millions denied welfare assistance and all of us barreling towards extinction because of refusal to curb the greed and destructive power of the fossil fuel industry, which has raked in $2.8 billion a day in profit over the last 50 years. The decisions of politicians like Biden had a staggering human cost, not only for the poor workers. What, is this doubled? Yes. Um, Biden morally vacuous and of limited intelligence is responsible for more suffering and death at home and abroad than Donald Trump, but the victims in the U.S. Punch and Judy media shows are rendered invisible, and that is why the victims despise the whole superstructure and want to tear it down. These establishment politicians and their appointed judges uh, promulgated promulgated laws that permitted the top 1% to loot $54 trillion from the bottom 90% from 1975 to 2022 at a rate of $2.5 trillion a year, according to a study by the RAND Corporation. The fertile ground of our political, economic, cultural, and social wreckage spawned an array of neo-fascists, con artists, racists, criminals, charlatans, conspiracy theorists, right-wing militias, and demagogues that will soon take power. Uh, decade, decayed societies such as the Weimar, Weimar Germany or the former Yugoslavia, which I covered for the New York Times, always vomited up political deformities who expressed the hatred of betrayed public feel for a corrupt ruling class and bankrupt liberalism. The twilight of the Greek, Roman, Ottoman, Hadsburg and Russian empires were no different. For those playing their Chris Hedges drinking game at home, they gotta they gotta hit that hit that shot up. Um, the political deformities play the role of the Snopes clan in William Faulkner's trilogy, The Hamlet, The Town, and The Mansion. The Snopes's wrested control in the South from a degenerate aristocratic elite. Flem Snopes and his extended family, which include a killer, a pedophile, and a bigamist, an arsonist, a mentally disabled man who copulates with a cow, and a relative who sells tickets to witness the bestiality, are fictional representations of the scum that hijacked the Republican Party. Um, William Faulkner right there, in case people didn't know what he looked like. Um, the usual reference to amorality, which accurate, is not sufficiently distinctive, and by itself does not allow us to place them, and as they should be, placed in a historical moment. The critical Irving Ho wrote of the Snopeses, perhaps the most important thing to be said is that they are what comes afterwards, the creatures that emerge from the devastation with the slime still upon their lips. Let a world collapse in the South or Russia, and there appear figures of coarse ambition driving their way up from beneath the social bottom, men to whom moral claims are not so much absurd as incomprehensible, sons of bushwhackers or mushiks drifting in from nowhere and taking over through the sheer outrageousness of their monolithic force, Howe wrote. They became presidents of local banks and chairmen of party regional committees, and later, a trifle slicked up, they muscled their way into Congress or the Politburo scavengers without inhibition. They need not believe in the crumbling official code of their society they need only learn to mimic its sounds. And there's no call for real democracy. I don't know if you guys heard of any. Um, I heard democracy was on the ballot, but didn't see anyone trying to fix that. Um, Biden and other establishment politicians are not actually calling for democracy. They are causing calling for civility. They have no intention of extracting the knife thrust into the backs of people. They hope to paper over the rot and the pain with the decorum of the polite. Measured talk they used to sell us the con of neoliberalism. The political well, we correctness. Oh, on yeah. Second, we saw this last week with Obama. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, during the thing, he was like, and when, um, you know, those um, protesters, you know, were yelling at him, he was like, basically, you need to shut up. You know, like, yeah. you need those. You're being rude. You're being rude, but there's a way that we, you have to. Would you go to a workplace to behave this way? Yes, yes yeah. I would. Go to a workplace. <laughs> yes, I would. In a case of an emergency, yeah, I would. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, My kids you, you know should, that. You should. You should have been there. Yeah. Huh? Well, Obama's not a very union centric out. guy. He's not seen anyone yell at the bosses yet. So, you know. Um, speaking no, of, well, I mean, well, look, that well, just he, indicates. He certainly didn't. I mean, look. That, I mean that that indicates just a. a, a completely 
neoliberal view of politics and of the world more broadly that he would compare a political event to a workplace environment. Yes. Would you behave like this at a workplace? Well, I'm yes. not at a workplace. I'm at a political rally. Right. right. You're not my boss. You know what yeah. I mean? Like this is a political event. You're no, a politician. Anything... In theory, you answer to me. I don't answer right. to you. But then right. like in an emergency Would you speak to your boss that way, sir? Um, right, exactly. Right. But yeah. in an emergency, like if you need people to get out of a building in case if like a, if like the building is burning, you got to do whatever you need to do to get people out of there. And I'm going to yeah. yell. Look, especially I have young kids. Like I yell if like in the case of that emergency, I'm like, get get out, you know, like so yeah. But well, I think they well they they don't they don't expect to be held accountable. And this is this is a lot of the hysteria about social media. I mean, I'm not saying there are not legitimate bad actors on social media. But if you look at a lot of what they're complaining about, when you look at a lot of what the journalists are complaining about, what the politicians are complaining about, they're complaining about accountability. Mm -hmm. they're, they're complaining about people having an outlet by which they can call them out in a very public way mm -hmm. and in which these the things they say can go viral and everyone can hear them. They don't like the fact that social media has given people a platform to petition the government in a very public way, or particularly to criticize journalists, right? Yeah. What do you, what do you, you I, I, I'm the one who's supposed to have a platform and dictate the conversation. What do you mean you're going to answer? You're not allowed to answer. That's really the issue with Elon Musk. Does anyone really, th and, and look, he's been, he's not doing himself any favors with his, I'm going to do this one day and this another day. And he really didn't do himself any favors tweeting out that Paul Pelosi article, you know, like five minutes into his takeover of Twitter. But all of the, all of that aside, does anyone really think Elon Musk is going to have Stormfront on Twitter now? Does, does anybody really believe that? that? That's not what it is. They, with the threat of congressional hearings, had cowed all of these tech leaders into all they had to say was this is disinformation okay okay we'll take it down we'll take it down don't worry they had gotten control of it they had gotten and where control do we find that out at on a podcast about aliens and monkeys you know like i've got to go watch joe rogan to get like that little bit of information well yeah. they've, they've done it to themselves it is essentially you know i, I think chrissy's main point but to continue the political correctness and inclusivity imposed by college educated elites, unfortunately has now become associated with the corporate assault as if female CEO or a black police officer is going to mitigate the exploitation and abuse. Minorities are always welcome as they were in other species of colonialism. If they serve the dictates of the masters, this is how Barack Obama, whom Cornell West called a black mascot for Wall Street became us president. Freedom for millions of enraged Americans has become the freedom to hate, the freedom to use a litany of slurs, the freedom to physically assault Muslims, undocumented workers, women, African Americans, homosexuals, and anyone who dares criticize their Christian fascism, the freedom to celebrate historical movements and figures that the college-educated elites condemn, including the KKK, and the Confederacy, the freedom to ridicule and dismiss intellectuals, ideas, science, and culture, the freedom to silence those who have been telling them how to behave, the freedom to revel in hyper-masculinity, racism, sexism, violence, and the patriarchy, which I made way too big, but, you know. But you know what, um, that's probably just as well, considering the word of a word words in there. there. Yeah. Um, that make us flat. So these. I, what did I tell you, Sheldon Wolin? Uh, I yep. told you. I told you be in there. Chrissy drinking game. Um, this crypto fascist thousand have always been part of the American landscape, but the disenfranchisement of millions of Americans, especially white Americans, has inflamed these hatreds. Voting for the architects of what political prisoner Sheldon Wallen calls a system of inverted totalitarianism will not make them go away. In fact, it will further discredit liberal ideas and liberal democracy. 
This puts liberals in a terrible bind. Um, the Democratic Party spent millions funding far-right Pied Piper candidates, assuming they would be easy to defeat, a tactic foolishly copied from the camp Clinton campaign, which secretly elevated Trump in the hopes that he would win the Republican nomination. The Democrats have worked to censor critics from the left and the right on social media. They claim they are the last bulwark against tyranny. None of these subterfuges will work. America will descend in a Victor Orban type of authoritarianism without profound political, social, and economic reform. After the Iraq war went sour, Chrissy, as someone who publicly opposed the invasion and had been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times, was often asked what the U.S. should do now. I answered that Iraq could no longer be put back together. It was broken. The U.S. broke it. Those who ask if we should support the Democrats as a tactic to halt a descent into tyranny are in a similar dilemma. My answer is no different. We should have walked out on the Democratic Party while we still had a chance. Um, I mean, any questions? I feel like Chrissy lays it out, as always, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think he makes a great point. I mean, you know, like I, like I said earlier, it seems like if you've read one Hedges article, you've kind of read them all. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, well, no, this no, one was a Hannah, lot shorter than Hannah, most of Hannah his. Hannah Arant was not mentioned in this one. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But um, well, yeah, I mean, that worse. distinction between democracy and civility is a very good point, mm -hmm. um, because the democracy that the liberal class uh, misses so much is one that is really um, only. Uh, it, it it only exists in the form of a certain decorum. And he used that exact word. And so, yeah, I mean, look, I think he's he's right on there. It's a, it's a politics you have to be very comfortable to be able to afford. The whole the whole liberal political project is a is a politics for comfortable people who really don't have to worry about inflation or yeah. how they're gonna make their house payments. It's a it's it's a politics for people who can settle for representation as a substitute for policy because they don't really need policy changes. They they can afford to invest in just feeling good about themselves because wow, look at all this representation, look at who we put in this cabinet position. Uh that's a politics you have to not know what an empty refrigerator looks like to cultivate. If your refrigerator is, is empty, it's, that's not your politics. It's guilt management on, on these people's parts because the people who can afford to have such a superficial understanding of what politics is, um, they understand if you're a liberal, like if you're a right winger, you know, you believe in, you know, survival of the fittest, right? You, mm -hmm. you sort of like believe um, in, in, just a, 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 right in just like this this very darwinian economic model and it's everybody sink or swim i swam so i have what i have and fuck everybody else mm -hmm. right they, they don't feel any guilt about it liberals feel a little guilty about it right they know that they are the beneficiaries of an unjust system and insofar as they are that it means their gains are at least to a certain extent ill-gotten right um and so liberal politics for them is about suppression of that guilt and nothing assuages them of that guilt more than a guy like Barack Obama ascending to the presidency. Oh, right. this guy was born to a single mother, uh, you know, a mixed race child. And, you know, he came from nothing and he went to Harvard and, you know, became a constitutional law professor and then the Senate and then the presidency, because the ascendance of a guy like Obama proves to these people that the system that they benefit from is not so unjust in right. their mind. That's how they make that work. Right. That's how they make that work. And no, that's what I, all this representation is all about. That's what all this diversity, equity, and inclusion bullshit is all about. All these corporations with these diversity programs and stuff like that and hiring. This is all just a way of to smooth over the brutalities of the capitalist system that they operate within. Right. It's a way to trick morons into believing that a corporation exists for any other reason but to make a profit. Right. Right. The social responsibility of, you know, Nike, right. Apple. It's a bunch of garbage. It's a bunch of garbage. And so representation is just a, a one 
part of that. And uh, that's why that's why it is so fetishized by, by these people. Well, that, right. that's that's why I, I always get into Disney, because it's such a great example, because Disney is perhaps the most visible corporation promoting a lot of identity politics and leading with that, where if you dig into it. More so bit, now. It never used the, to be. Well, no, no, no. I mean, now. I mean, I mean, yeah. current current day Disney. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this goes back to wanting to get, uh, you know, the, the uh, socially responsible scores for corporations, the ESG scores. They want to get they want to get those. Um, Disney, you know, it's it's recently, I, you know, we we've had a lot of fun with the show She-Hulk, which became like this flashpoint of like fourth wave feminism. But what was really interesting to me about it is you had a lot of women who, you know, fiercely defended this show and none of them seemed to know or they didn't care that Disney is currently being sued for wage discrimination by several women. Mm-hmm. That that's it. That's it. That is that is representation. Right. <laughs> they're, can... they're doing this. They, they do this show that went out of its way basically to troll the male fan base with a kind of very you know, a uh, half-assed feminist theme. And uh, meanwhile, they're being sued for wage discrimination. Mm-hmm. Here, here they are doing all of these diver- they're doing a Black Little Mermaid, but they're thanking a Uyghur concentration camp in the closing credits of Mulan. Pay Dis- no Disney attention. Disney is the ultimate neoliberal corporation. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, pretty much, right? Yep, yep. Um, look, look, look at this hand. Don't look at this hand. Look at what they look at them. Oh, puppet show, puppet show. Don't look at what we're really doing.